there were jobs to be done. These women had volunteered to do them. At home or on duty assignments that carried them around the world, they proved themselves worthy of the traditions behind them and equal to whatever tasks were ahead of them. Wherever they landed, they took the situation well in hand. Many of them, like these nurses at Anzio, came in while the guns were still hot. All over the world, wherever they were needed or wherever regulations permitted them to be sent, American women were to write new, stirring chapters in the histories of each of the services. tell myself that it was, the farm was much better than basic training. Oh yeah, the, the farm is, is not, was not as, uh, as grueling as, as basic training, you know. And then I said to myself, but you're in now, there's no way out. And when basic training ended, I said, voila, on to the next step. You know, I think I was there about nine months. I put in for my first visit to my hometown in Washington, North Carolina. I purchased my ticket and boarded a bus. It was a trailway bus. I boarded this bus to take my first journey home after entering the military. I had purchased my ticket uh, making sure that I had a, a straight through bus, a bus with no changes. But to my surprise, when I got to Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina, uh, there was a big problem, one I had not foreseen. The driver uh, collected a little stub of everyone that was already seated, and when he got to me, he said, uh, I want you to get up and go to, to the rear of the bus. And I told him I was comfortable seated, seated where, I was, where I was. He didn't say anything, he just kept on with his business, collecting the tickets. So he came back to the front, and as he passed the two-seater, I'm by the window, and a Marine on temporary duty, had been on temporary duty from Fort Dix, McGuire Air Base is where he was on temporary duty from, traveling back to uh, Camp Lejeune. I told the driver, you know, I passed, I reached out with my ticket, and he said, uh, <laughs> I'm not taking your ticket, and he kept straight off. He kept straight to the door. He got off the bus and came back in about 15 minutes. And he said, I want everyone on this bus to get off except that woman that refused to move to the rear. She can stay here until this bus moves out, but it's not going any place tonight. You know, it was sort of like a shock. Did I just hear something that I, I'm understanding what the man is saying? But I can't stay on this bus by myself. And when I entered the bus station, uh, I proceeded to the window, ticket window. And when I got to the ticket window, the lady behind the curtain, the ticket window, she pulled the curtain down and dimmed the lights. It's sort of like in a movie, you know? When she did that, I turned around, and there was a tall guy pushing a broom. And he said to me, Miss, don't you know who you, where you are? 
I said to myself, Oh, God, Sarah, you are in trouble. I went back out to the line because there, there were about a couple of people still to get on the bus. And I said to the driver again, is something wrong with my ticket? He said, no, but you are you're not riding this bus tonight. And the policeman was standing about five feet away. And they said to the driver, is this the one? The driver said, yes. The one got on one side, one on the other side. He really didn't manhandle me like most people really think, you know. But it was all like in a movie that night, you know, one that probably most people had never seen before. You know, with this occurring, this woman, these policemen, that driver. <laughs> oh, goodness. So they locked me up for sure. Took me to this place, I guess twice as large as this room. A couple of windows and with bars on the windows and uh, a sink in the corner with a stool and a, a mattress on the floor that was dirtier than any that you see discarded in the street. And I said to myself, I can't touch that. I can't lie down or sit down. And I wouldn't even wash my hands in the sink. So I paced the floor all night. I mean, you travel, you travel in dress uniform, meaning your heels, at least one and an inch, one and a half inch heel. So I paced the floor all night. And I cried and I prayed. I asked God to help me. You know, it was sort of like, uh, you're breathing, but how are you breathing? You know, what is happening to me? What is happening? What am I going to do? What are you going to say to your, your family? You were in jail. I sort of know how I got there, but I don't belong here. Why would I come to jail for, for something, for the steps and moves that I've just made up to here? So all night I'm pacing the floor, walking and pacing and crying, walking and pacing and crying. The jailer came the next morning, took me to the, before the chief of police that I was before the night before. And the chief of police said, is that a uniform you're wearing? I said, you mean to tell me you, you don't know the color of the United States Army uniform? So he said to me, that's why you spent the night in jail, because you're too damn smart. All the disparaging of, of things that I've seen happen in life, you know, the mistreatment of people that I've seen. If you don't have someone around to speak up for you, you're like a dead duck, you know. But I'd like to be remembered as someone who helped somebody along the way, you know. I like the Pioneer Trailblazer. You know, for me, I like those terms. <laughs>